Good morning to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Today is Sunday, June 20th, 2020, and we are just so blessed to be in the house of the Lord one more time. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church located on the west side of Chicago, 5200 West Jackson. On behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday school superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all of the officers, our instructors, and our entire church membership, we're just so blessed and thankful that you have decided to join us one more time for our Sunday school hour. Again, today is the third Sunday in June, and so we just, we just want to begin by just wishing all of the fathers, all of the men that have played intricate roles in the lives of the young people in this nation, in this city, and especially in our church, Happy Father's Day. I know I want to say Happy Father's Day to our pastor, Dr. Backus, uh, uh, Deacon Lindsay is in here with me this morning, so especially Happy Father's Day to him. And then, of course, to my own father, Thomas Savage Sr. He's in, uh, out of town with my mother right now, but we wish him a Happy Father's Day. And then to Arthur Cooper, uh, Christie's father, my father-in-law in D.C. and in, in the D.C. area, I wish you a Happy Father's Day as well. Uh, to all the men, all the fathers, we just praise God for your influence and the presence in the lives. I know I can count on so many men that have made wonderful contributions in my life that have helped uh, shape me into the man that I am right now. I don't want to even start calling names, but just to name a few, uh, Stephen Love, Shelby Wyatt, uh, Alvin Love, and of course, of course, uh, uh, Reverend Tyrone Kreider, who passed away uh, four years ago. We praise God for those men and just thankful for all the lives that you have impacted. But I just want to especially say Happy Father's Day to my father for his patience, his love, and his example. He uh, serves as the chairman of the deacon board at Lilydale First Baptist on the south side of Chicago. And I, I just can't tell you enough of how much he's meant to me and to my friends, to my family. Just praise God for his example as a, as a father, as a man, as a husband. Most importantly, as a Christian, I praise God for his faith. So happy Father's Day to everyone out there. I pray that today would be a great day for you, a blessing for you. And may God continue to strengthen each and every one of your lives. Bless your ministries, bless your homes, bless your marriages, your children. And just please continue to stay on the battlefield and fight the good fight. There's a lesson from the Lord today. It's entitled, A Healing Touch, taken from the ninth chapter of Matthew, verses 18 through 26. Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 through 26. And our key verse comes in Matthew chapter 9, verse 22. The text reads, but Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. In today's lesson, we have three goals. First, that we will examine the woman of faith and the girl in our passage. Secondly, we will grasp the power of God that healed and gave life to both the woman and the girl. And then third, we will finally identify and celebrate the healing power of God in our own lives. Uh, so again, uh, a healing touch, Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 through 26. And this won't be a very long lesson, but I believe it'll be a powerful lesson from a very familiar passage. We'll start with prayer and we'll jump right in. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you've done in our lives. Father, we thank you for your continued presence. We thank you for uh, your revelation that you continue to reveal your will for us. So Father, right now we ask that you help us to humble ourselves, to accept your plans for our life, to walk in those plans, and to avoid, avoiding, uh, avoid turning our back on you. Father, we confess that we have fallen short that we made mistakes, but we thank you right now for your grace and your mercy, your saving power that comes through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. Now, Father, look inside each and every one of us, whatever is not like you, whatever does not belong, pluck it away, replace it with your love, with your wisdom, but right now, most importantly, your word. Lift us up higher that we might see you clearer and better understand your will for our lives. Now, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It is in your darling son, Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Amen. Again, a healing touch. Now, my mother's uh, favorite scripture is the healing of the woman with the issue of blood. It's a bit painting that she had in our living room, pretty much as I could remember. Uh, I know our first lady, uh, Sister Carolyn Love, had the same uh, picture in her house. And this was even the first, uh, this is the sermon, or this is the text that I preached when I preached my trial sermon. Some... 15 years ago now. So I just praise God for this text. I praise God uh, for uh, the lessons that it has taught us. And I praise God for the impact that it has made in the lives of those around me. Uh, in this ninth chapter of Matthew, we see Jesus continuing to move through the uh, 
the sea, the coastline of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, in our last lesson, he had sailed to the Gardenes and he healed or he, he calmed the, the sea as the disciples were afraid that they would die. And then we see him go across and then he cast out the demons into the pigs and they all jump out the cliff. And so Jesus is now in Capernaum, continuing to move to these coastline cities and uh, perform miracles to preach sermons and the crowd just start to gather and gather. He really starts to get the attention of the entire area uh, as word of his sermons, as word of his miracles uh, spread like wildfire. Uh, so his followers were not just believers. Jesus had believers, he had naysayers, he had doubters, he had the leaders of the uh, temple, he had the Jewish elders. Everyone was following behind Jesus, just trying to really grasp and understand what was taking place because nothing like this had ha ever happened before. There had been famous people, even people that had claimed or people assumed was the promised Messiah. But never before have they seen miracles like this, have they hear, heard preaching like this, and the crowds just came and gathered like never before. So in the ninth chapter of Matthew, where our lesson takes place, he begins to clarify the theology of God, and he also assumes or he, he, he puts on full display his authority as the Son of God, uh, the Messiah, and as God among us, God in flesh. So the chapter starts with Jesus hearing, healing a paralytic boy, uh, forgiving him of, of his sins. Now, Jesus, for the first time, or one of the first times in his ministry, is accused of blasphemy by the Jewish elders. And they actually question, by what authority does he have to heal sins? And so Jesus begins to clarify that he does not just come as a preacher or as a miracle worker, but he is the Son of God, that he has the full authority of God. And so now Jesus is beginning to get in question, and he's starting to challenge the temple system by proving that salvation does indeed lie in his hands. So he then uh, goes and he uh, finds Matthew, a tax collector, invites Matthew to follow him, and he's sitting down in Matthew's house eating dinner. Again, the Jewish elders, the naysayers, the doubters, this enrages them because if we know anything about the history of tax collectors uh, at this time is that they literally were the physical manifestation of the Roman occupation by which the children of Israel found themselves under. So for so many, time, for so many years, the children of Israel had encountered uh, slavery or occupation, whether it was from the uh, Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, and now they find themselves under Roman occupation. So the difference between the Roman occupation was this was the first uh, occupation that kind of made the children of Israel begin to abandon their heritage. There was a universal monetary system, there was a universal language, so the Old Testament was in Hebrew, the New Testament now in Greek, and the children of Israel started to change. It became more of a globalized uh, a, glo a, glo a globalized economy, a globalized world, and you start to see an uh, 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 adaptation, if you will, from old time ways. And so with the changing of language in the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament period, because there was a silence from amongst God's people, they did not hear the voice of God, they started to abandon some of the old ways, and this tax collector who was there as the representation of the occupant of the occupiers the Roman government they kind of just represented everything that the children of Israel hated they represented uh, their subject their subjugation at the hands of the Romans they represented a limit on their freedom and it represented a harsh occupation that basically sucked them dry of all their resources and so as he sits down with Matthew and begins to eat, they're saying, what type of man is this? He claims to be the son of God. He claims to be the Messiah. Yet he's sitting at the table with tax collectors, the very people who are oppressing us as a people. And so Jesus, he starts with this healing, this paralytic boy. And then he goes and sits at the tax collectors uh, uh, table with Matthew. And it infuriates the Pharisees and the Jewish leader. So he doesn't only fellowship but he falls into this deep companionship with someone that the church uh, leaders feels is unworthy of acceptance. And so we, we see here in the text that Jesus has this ability to overlook someone's faults, to overlook what the world thinks about someone, and to see us for who we really are instead of what the world sees us are. Now in a world in which, in which we are held accountable for pretty much everything we say, do, think, or even tweet, it's refreshing to see that God has a short memory that God doesn't see us based on one incident, that God doesn't see us uh, based on one uh, action or one tweet, but God sees us in the larger contrast of our life. Uh, there has uh, been a great debate this past week, uh, especially on social media, 
uh, whether the young lady that was killed uh, during the Capitol riots on January 6th by the officer that was shot and ended up dying uh, that day, whether she was a martyr or whether she was a terrorist. And her family is trying to say, regardless of the actions that she did on that day, uh, she, uh, her, her entire life is bigger than that one mistake. And they're trying to paint her as a hero because she was a former armed service veteran and things like that. And I think the irony is that these same people oftentimes cast away young black men, young brown men because of one mistake. Our jails are filled with young black and brown boys who made a lapse of judgment, committed a crime, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, acted against what they knew to be better judgment, and they have become products of the system, and they've been stuck behind bars pretty much their entire lives, just learning to be even worse criminals in the system, coming out not rehabilitated, but taught how to be criminals, and just going in and out of the jail system. And we must understand the same way uh, that they're trying to portray this young lady, that her actions or her life is bigger than this one mistake. So many of us fall into that same category. However, the world will tell us that because we've made mistakes, that because we've stumbled, that because we've fallen, that we are beyond redemption, that we are beyond acceptance, that we are beyond forgiveness. But Jesus makes it clear as he sits at the table with Matthew, a tax collector who is hated by pretty much everyone, that there is forgiveness in God if we simply have the right heart and the right spirit. And so if we don't remember anything else in today's lesson, just understand that no matter how the world looks at you, no matter how the world thinks of you, if your heart is right, if your faith is attached to Jesus Christ, then not only is there forgiveness, but God can welcome you into a right fellowship with him, and you can be moved beyond your past mistakes. Uh, so Jesus is, uh, he's, he's questioned about his disciples. Uh, after he heals the paralytic, after he eats with Matthew, then they start asking Jesus, like, wait a minute, how come your disciples are not fasting? This is a time of fasting. And so Jesus, in his response, he clarifies the purpose of fasting. He shows that there's no need for his disciples and his followers to fast because they are literally walking with God. And Jesus alludes that fasting is meant to remember and focus on God's work and his, his impending return to rapture his chosen people. But while he's walking with his disciples, they are literally fellowshipping with God and there is no need for fasting. And so God, in this clarification of fasting, he really gives us a glimpse of what it's meant to be. Uh, because there's an absence of a physical absence of God in our lives, we, of course, have the Holy Spirit in and around us, but we do not have Jesus in flesh or God in flesh walking with us. And so when we fast, when we engage in sacrificing something that takes up time and instead focusing that time on God, and I just want to throw in fasting is not just about food. You can fast from anything that takes up time in your life, television, social media, uh, uh, hobbies, uh, clubs, organizations, you can fast from those things, turn your back on those things for a, a amount of time, and instead of spending your time there, take that time and spend it with God. And so when we fast from a food perspective, if you're going to spend 30 minutes at lunch a day, you take that 30 minutes, and instead of going to lunch, you pray and you spend time with God by fellowshipping in his word. Same thing if you're going to do it with social media or television. I know good and well as much television that I watch. I could turn my back on a few of those shows, but if I find time, if I find myself doing other things with, those time, with that time instead of spending it with the Lord, it's really not fasting. And so we take time away from what we normally do to spend it with God. And Jesus is saying, because I'm here, there's no reason for them to do that. And so just a clarification of what fasting is in our life. And we just love how Jesus in these early chapters in Matthew continues to clarify and just uh, bring new understanding and new light to these theological principles, such as forgiveness, such as healing, and of course, such as fasting here in the ninth chapter. So Jesus extends the availability of fellowship uh, by walking with the tax collector by someone that is considered a, a physical manifestation, as I said before, of the Roman occup uh, occupation, and he's, he's walking with them, he's fellowshipping with them, showing that no one is beyond redemption, no one is beyond for, uh, forgiveness. And then Jesus clarifies his position as the third Godhead, showing that there is no need for his disciples to fast when he is with them. And then finally, at the table, in Matthew's house, the tax collector's house, a ruler barges in. He hears about Jesus and he comes to him so that Jesus could come and heal his dead daughter. And that's where our lesson picks up. So this is not going to be a long lesson, a short lesson, but I promise you it's going to be a blessing for each and every one of us. So the first part of our lesson 
is entitled The Request of a Desperate Father. The Request of a Desperate Father. Taken from the ninth chapter of Matthew, verses 18 and 19. I'll be reading the New King James Version. The text reads, While he spoke these things to him, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. So Jesus is in the midst of dinner with Matthew. Again, this tax collector. And it shows that the gospel has been extended to those that the world might see as unfit to receive this gift of salvation, this gift of fear, forgiveness. It shows that all are welcome at the feet of Jesus as long as we come to him with the right heart. And it also shows that your past does not prevent you from the future that God has planned for you. So this ruler, he burst into the house, in Matthew's house, a tax collector's house. He honors Jesus by falling prostrate, humbling himself before uh, Jesus laying prostrate before him and beginning to worship God. So if we look at this ruler, we see three things must have happened. Uh, one that we're sure of. One, he must have heard about Jesus. Second, he must have believed in Jesus. And third, his belief forced him into engaging with Jesus. So heard. Most of us hear stuff all the time, but we do nothing. I remember uh, Deacon Lindsay, about 15 years ago, all my friends were yelling to me about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. Bitcoin cost about $400 a share back then. They were saying, this is the next wave of the future. You need to jump into it. Then about three years ago, my wife, Christy, told me she thought about investing in, crypt in, in Bitcoin. It was $11,000 at the time. I said, I don't know about this. It seems fishy. I wouldn't do it. Next thing you know, Bitcoin hit a $60,000 high. Right now, it's right under $40,000. Now, even though it's dropped from its high, imagine if we would have got in at $450, or if we would have got in at $1,100, I mean $11,000. It would have been at minimum a 300% return on our, on our investment. 15 years ago, we're talking about a 1,000% return on investment. So a $1,000 uh, investment would have netted a hundred thousand. Well, my math might be off, but a hundred thousand dollars. And imagine the life-changing impact that investment would have made. I knew about it, I heard about it, but for some reason, I did not believe in it. Now, I'm still kind of leery on cryptocurrency, and I'm not a financial advisor, so please do your research before jumping into it. But it's just evidence how we hear of things all the time, but some reason or not, we we don't believe, we doubt, and it causes it prevents us from moving forward. So this guy heard about Jesus. Again, all the crowds, all the news was spreading. These hundreds and dozens of people, maybe even thousands of people following Jesus because they're seeing the miracles, they're hearing the sermons, and word is spreading like quit fire. One of my favorite quotes is from Charles and John Wesley. They said, if you catch on fire for Jesus, people will come from miles to see you burn. And the entire region this uh, Galilean region, this Capernaum region, the Sea of Galilee, the coastline shores, they all began to follow Jesus because they heard. So not only did he hear, but he believed. He took it a step further. His hearing caused him to believe. And my brothers and sisters, we can all testify in our lives how the testimonies of others the encouragement of others, the sermon that was preached, the lesson that was taught, the song that was sung, the prayer that was uttered, the scripture that was read. Not only did we hear it, but it pushed us into belief. And I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting in a church and it seemed as if the choir was singing directly to me. It seemed as if the preacher was preaching directly to me. The deacon was uh, praying directly to me. The Sunday school teacher was teaching directly to me because the lesson, the sermon, the song, the prayer, the scripture was speaking directly to my situation and it was just confirmation that God not only was understanding what I was going through but he was speaking to it and giving me a deliverance and an understanding on that I was not only able to survive it but I was to make it out so he heard and then he believed now our past teaches us to be skeptical uh, because of our experience with the world shows us that there is nothing but failure and letdown However, our past in Jesus should teach us to believe because when we look back over our life and think about all the good things God has done for us, we are taught to not only believe, but understand that it is God that has made ways out of no way. It is God that has pulled us out the miry pit of sin, and it is God that has set us upon a solid foundation that is the rock in his son, Jesus Christ. So he heard, he believed, but he also engaged. Uh, our, our belief should push us into action. It's not just good enough to hear. It's not just good enough to believe, but we should use that as a momentum to push us into action. There is nothing sadder than a Christian that has lost hope. 
I know that we have not always got what we wanted. I know that we have not always seen things work out the way we would have planned. But I've learned from the songwriter that Jesus is an on-time God, and he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. And so we must celebrate and accept the fact that just because we did not get what we wanted all the time in the past does not mean that God is absent in our lives. It does not mean that God is ignoring us in our lives. But we should use that what we hear to push us into belief, and that belief should push us into engaging in our faith, to engaging with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So this ruler bursts into this tax collector's house. And by all means, he shouldn't have been entering the tax collector's house because of the, 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 the negative connotation it had because of the tax collector's status among the people. But he bursts into the house, and he doesn't just run off a list of requests like we sometimes do to God, but he falls down and begins to worship the Lord. And so we see that he worships Christ before requesting of Christ. Now, I must admit that even I've been guilty of this in my own life. I have no problem going to God and begging for forgiveness, begging for deliverance, telling God, if you just forgive me, if you just get me out of this, if you just help me make it through. But oftentimes in life, uh, I forget that, well, I used to. I must admit that uh, by the faith of God, by the blessings of God, I've been doing a lot better now. But sometimes in life, I can look back in my life and there was an absence of worship and it was just a request. I treated God like a Santa Claus, just gave him a list of wants and desires and came back when I needed more. But we must take, uh, take the example of this ruler that even when there's urgency in our life, even when his daughter is dead and he knows that there's time is of the essence, he starts by worshiping God before requesting of God. And if we would just be able to abide in a constant place of worship with God, it would make it so much easier to not only understand the will of God in our lives, but to be able to better engage God when we need him to do those amazing and miraculous things in our lives. Uh, it's so much easier when you're in good fellowship when you're constantly talking and, and living with God and abiding in his word and talking to him through prayer and scripture all day long, it's so much easier to not understand what he wants and has for us, but to move into that request stage in our faith. And this ruler shows us that it's time to worship God instead of just ask of God. So this ruler didn't allow pretenses of norms to prevent him from getting to Jesus. Like I said before, he entered into the tax collector's house, but his authority as the ruler probably should have prevented him from approaching Jesus the way that he did. First of all, we assume that Jesus was not his first stop. Uh, because he was a ruler, he had money. Uh, the house that he had, it says that it was enough for all the crowds to enter and Jesus put them out. So he knew, we see that he had a large house, but still in fact, he recognized that even when the world let him down, when the doctors, when all the wise men were unable to uh, uh, heal his daughter and even prevent her death, he still got to Jesus Christ. And so we recognize that no matter who we go to for help, who we go to for assist, assistance, uh, here in the text is his last stop, but ideally and hopefully our first stop should be Jesus Christ. Uh, so many times in our lives, we waste time and energy and effort trying to go to everyone but God. But I've learned if I can just put it in God's hands and leave it there, it's so much better in God's hands than it is in my own hands. So we assume that Jesus was in this first stop. Then we also assume that he had servants that he could have sent to Jesus to request on his behalf. Again, a ruler that was rich with servants, he most certainly could have said, go get Jesus uh, don't offer Jesus this, but this man did not uh, allow others to do what he could. Now, when I was young, I used to have to depend on my mother and my grandmother to pray for me, for those that uh, loved me and, and cherished me to petition God on my behalf. And I remember late nights when I would be up kind of doing things I had no business doing. I would come home and you could tell my mom was worried and couldn't get back to sleep and trying to make sure that everything was all right. Times when she would call me, just let me know she was praying on me. But now I've grown and matured in my faith where I praise God for the prayers of others, but I don't need no one else at this point to pray for me. Now, I appreciate it, but I'm strong enough in my faith that I could go to God on my own. And this ruler shows us that no matter how important you are, no matter how wealthy you are, no matter how many people answer to your authority, 
authority that there should be nothing preventing you from going to God alone. Now, a lot of times as a preacher, as deacons, leaders in the church, you'll hear people come up to you and say, can you pray for me? Or next time you talk to God, remember me. And I say, no problem. I'll definitely pray for you. But you got the same access that I got. I don't have a, a special room. I don't have a VIP section. I go to the, God the same way that we all go to God. And we should be grateful that God is an accepting God that doesn't put barriers between us and him and just allows us to move forward according to our faith. So we also see that he didn't care what others might think. He entered into this house and fall flat. He basically made a scene. Now, a lot of time, we like to look dignified. We like to make sure that we have it all together. Uh, as men, we're taught it is not manly to cry. It's not manly to talk about your emotions. But this man let it all out. When you get to a point where there's nothing you can do, it's hard to contain yourself when you're engaging with God. And this ruler said, listen, I need God to show up and show out in my life. I don't care what you think. I don't care if it's tears in my eyes. I don't care if I get my clothes wrinkled. I don't care if people laugh at me. And every now and then we should have a worship and a praise that just cannot be contained. I don't care if you understand. You may not understand my praise and that's because you don't understand my story. And every now and then we need to get a, a case of the can't help it. I can't help but worship God. I can't help but praise his name. I can't help but glorify the good things that God and praise God for the good things that he's done in my life. And so he didn't care what others think. And then finally he didn't allow his status to prevent him from worship. Nothing should stand in the way of what God has called us to be and what God has called us to do. And a worship is birthed out of an uncontrollable praise and recognition of God's not only presence, but his glorious works in our lives. And so this ruler did not allow anything to stop him from worshiping and praising the Lord because he recognized that only God would be able to heal his condition and raise his daughter. So finally, he didn't allow death or even the world's limits to uh, diminish his faith in Jesus Christ. We have been conditioned to believe that the world's final statement is the end. But this ruler demonstrates that God's power extends beyond the limits of the world. I know that when the coroner gives their final report, once there's no breath, once there's no life in the body, that is the end. But we praise God that we serve a God whose power and authority supersedes that of even death. When Jesus gave his life on the cross for our sins, he descended into hell. And on the third day, he rose again with all power in his hands. That's power over life and power over death. And while we don't see these oftentimes in current days, we don't see these miraculous Raising from the dead miracles. I don't know if my God can, but like the three Hebrew boys, I'm sorry, I don't know if my God will, but like the three Hebrew boys, I know my God can. And I've come to learn in my faith, I've come to learn in my life that the only limits on God is the limits that I put on him. That oftentimes we try to put God in a box that makes us comfortable, but I've learned that God is so much bigger than my box. I'm reminded of the woman that was out of food. It says she filled up the jars and all the jars that she had was filled to the top until so there was no room for any more. And I've heard preachers say before that the reason why she had to stop because she didn't bring enough jars. And if she would have brought more jars, God would have even filled those jars up too. And so we have to recognize in our faith that the more we believe in God, the more authority and power we allow God to have in our lives, the more God can do. And oftentimes the limit uh, or what we think are limits in God's lives are not imposed by God, but rather are imposed by us. So this ruler, he doesn't care if she has a heartbeat. He doesn't care how many hours has passed. He still believes that even at the point of death, Jesus could perform miracles. And oh, what faith this ruler shows. Because for so many of us, when we get the pink slip, we think that it's too late. When we get the eviction notice, when we run out of money, when our gas tank is on E, but we serve a God, I don't care what the lawyer says, I don't care what our bank account says, I don't care what the doctor says, even when they say there's nothing else can, that can be done, we serve a God that can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask, as long as we have faith to believe that he has the power. So this ruler knew what God could do and let nothing stop him from engaging what he believed after hearing about God. So this man's faith, it pushed God into action. Jesus doesn't give a speech. 
He doesn't finish his meal. He doesn't ask him to wrap it up so he can go later. It says he immediately stood up and followed the ruler and all of his disciples followed with him. So now Jesus in this tax collector's house where people are upset that he's eating with Matthew because of Matthew's social status. A ruler bursts in, falls on his face, begins to worship Jesus and beg Jesus to come and heal his daughter who has died. And Jesus immediately gets up and the entire crowd follows him from Matthew's house to the ruler's house. It doesn't really take a long sermon or a long speech. It don't take a bit of negotiation. All we have to do is engage Jesus with the right faith, the right impetus, the right spirit of worship. And Jesus can speak directly to our situation and move like no other person can. And so we praise God of this ruler's faith, but we also praise God of the response of Jesus that immediately when he went to Christ with the right spirit, with the right petition, God immediately answered and responded. And so perhaps this ruler is showing us that if we just have the right faith, if we have the right attitude, if we have the right spirit of worship, that Jesus is not only able, but he's ready to step right into our situation and turn it around. So in 18 and 19, we see the request of a desperate father. But we move down into Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 and 22, and we see a sick but determined woman. The text, Matthew 9, 20 through 22, in the New King James Version, the text reads, And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. So these crowds continued to follow Jesus, and the attention he received in Capernaum only increased the numbers of followers. Now, the crowds were so large, Jesus had no peace. If we remember our last lesson, Jesus literally sailed across the Sea of Galilee just so he could get some rest, sleeping in the bottom of the boat until he was awake, awake, awoken by his disciples and asked to help because they feared that they would die because of the storm. And so Jesus has these crowds. He's really tired. He's moving around, but he's moving through the crowd, making his way from Matthew's house uh, to the ruler's house to raise the ruler's daughter from the dead. So all that followed Jesus, again, did not believe. Jesus had these crowds, but it was the Jewish elders that were uh, threatened by his authority and his fame. It was the naysayers who didn't believe. It was those that were just following to get a blessing, to get a meal, uh, to get a healing. And then there were those that really believed and followed. So you got these large crowds of a mixed group of people, some trying to start mess, some just trying to see what's going on, some bored and nothing else to do, and some are believers. Uh, and so we want to recognize that just because someone is with you or even behind you doesn't mean that they support you. Everyone that shows up to this church is not believing in the work that the church is doing. But that doesn't mean that we stop moving forward. It means that we continue to trust in God and proceed. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed in church, and it's amazing to me, I talk about it all the time. Church is one of the only places where people will continue to go back and be happy. If you don't like your haircut, you probably won't go back to that barbershop. If you don't like your dinner, you probably won't go back to that restaurant. If you don't like the groceries you get, you probably won't go back to that grocery store. Yet church is one of the few places where people will continue to come week after week, day after day, and complain about it and not be happy. That being said, as leaders, as those that have been called to uh, lead and be in leadership and authority positions in the church, we must not be... Uh, we must not find ourselves discontent. We must not find ourselves uh, depressed. We must not find ourselves uh, willing to give up the fight simply because everyone in the crowd, everyone in the audience, everyone that's even following us does not believe in the mission that God has placed us on. The work that we do is for God and God alone. And so if people don't want to hear you sing, as long as God has called you to sing, you keep on singing. If people don't want to hear you preach, as long as God has called you to preach and gave you that sermon, you keep on preaching. It's the same thing with the ushers, with the deacons, with the nurses. I don't care if you're the security guy or the janitor that cleans the bathroom. If that, has what, if that is what God has called you to do, you do it with a good heart regardless of what others are saying, and you be accountable to God and not man. I've learned in life that you can't change nobody's mind. All you can do is stay faithful to what God has called you to do and who God has called you to be. Let the love of Christ permeate your actions and all that you do. And in time, God will change their hearts according to his plan. What the, the worst thing that we can do is leadership 
is leaders in the church, is authority figures in the church, is identify those that don't like us, identify those that don't support the program that God has given us or the work that God has called us to do and start taking retribution against them or start taking action against them to not only let them know that we don't, we recognize their, their dislike, but we uh, uh, flex our authority or our muscles, if you will, to make them uncomfortable in their, in their, in their hatred or their discontent. God has called us to love our brothers and sisters. And regardless how they treat us, regardless how they talk about us, we must continue to love them and allow our love to permeate through all that we do. Every time we look at them, touch them, talk to them, they should feel nothing but the love of God. And only that will be able to change the hardened heart. And so this, the, uh, Jesus, he doesn't turn away those uh, that are not following him. He doesn't tell the Jewish leaders to stop following him. He just continues to move forward according to God's plan, even though he knows that some people don't like him. And as he's moving forward, it's this, 12, it's this woman that has had an issue of blood for 12 years. Uh, now, the issue of blood was that she, uh, she was hemorrhaging, literally hemorrhaging blood, could not uh, stop bleeding. And because of Old Testament Jewish customs, she was considered unclean because of her uh, blood issue. Now, by custom, she should not have even been out in public. She was considered filthy and undesirable, and most people probably would have shunned her and looked down on her. And then we see how serious the issue is because sometimes we think that she was like this Navy SEAL crawling on the ground trying to be clandestine, but the issue of blood had weakened her to the point where she was even unable to walk. And so many of us in our lives have allowed our physical condition, have allowed the sins that we've committed to weaken us to the point where we're unable to operate normally. But even in her weakened condition, she had not only the faith, but the fortitude to find, to find her way to Jesus Christ, no matter how uncomfortable it might have been, no matter how difficult it might have been, and no matter what others might have thought about her. So it says that she had this issue for 12 years and that she had spent all that she had but was in the same condition. And so spending all that she had meant that she probably went to doctors and healers and experts. They took her money, were not able to make her better, and now she found herself broke because of the situation. Oftentimes, the world will take us as we are, take all that we have, and leave us in the same or in a worse situation. But just like this ruler knew to get to God, Jesus Christ, and just like this woman with the issue of blood knew to get to Jesus Christ, we must too recognize that no matter who we think can help, no matter what we think is best, our first stop should always be God because God is the one that has all power and authority over our situation. Now, this is a difficult uh, aspect of faith because we're taught to be wise but also have faith in God. So if you have a broken bone, I'm not telling you to say, I'm going to give my arm to Jesus and Jesus can fix it. Yes, we trust that Jesus can make our way out of no way, but we also must be wise enough to go to the doctor or the hospital and get that bone treated. So we don't ignore the ability of man to help us through our situation, but we do have faith that that ability came from God and that we first trust God and seek his direction in all that we do to heal us in the conditions we find ourselves in. So don't ignore science because science comes from God. Don't ignore medicine because medicine comes from God, but don't allow science and medicine to be your first stop. We take all of our burdens, all of our cares, all of our worries, we place them in God's hands, and then in turn, we take, uh, we take uh, the wisdom and the knowledge that God has given us and move forward accordingly as long as it's within accordance to our faith and belief in Jesus Christ. So both the ruler and the woman with the issue of blood had exhausted all possibilities before getting to Jesus, but at least they had the faith to know that Jesus was able to turn their situation around. Her condition weakened her physical state, but not her faith. And I know we're tired. I know we've been fighting for a long time. I know many of us has gone through so many difficult things in our life. And even though we might uh, uh, be overwhelmed at times, even though we might feel as if the storms are raging and we just can't see it, uh, uh, we can't see the sunshine, we can't see the deliverance, we should never allow circumstances to weaken our faith. We must have a, a spirit of belief, a spirit of faithfulness, a spirit of comfort, knowing that no matter how bad the situation might be, no matter what we're going through, no matter what others might think, no matter how embarrassed 
or depressed we might find ourselves, that God still can make a way out of no way, that God still has final say and authority over every situation in our lives. And so we trust that God is, is ruler over all, that he's in control over all. And regardless of how uncomfortable we might be, regardless of how weakened we might be, we can still just get to God and he can change and turn our situation around. So however we can get to Jesus, if you got to crawl, if you got to limp, if you got to be dropped through a roof, if you have to be carried, just get your burdens to Jesus and Jesus can turn your situation around. Then finally this woman gets to him and she touches the hem of his garment. And she shows us that just a touch from the, from the Lord can heal our situation. Jesus didn't need words. He didn't make a bit sing. All she needed to do was just get and touch the hem of his garment. And so we see that her proximity to Jesus strengthened her faith and healed her condition. Now, perhaps in our own lives, we're missing our blessing. We're missing our miracle. We're missing our deliverance. We're missing our healing not just because of a lack of faith, but sometimes because even in our strong faith, even in a deep faith in God, the distance that we have between God creates barriers between the work that God is willing and able to do in our lives. Uh, this woman shortened the distance between her and God and therefore was able to be healed by God. And I, I would dare say that oftentimes in life, when we can't hear from God, when we feel as if God is not active in our lives, it's not just or only because a weakened faith or a lack of faith, but it's sometimes because of a distance between us and God. And so how do we shorten that distance or remove that distance between God? It's by spending time with God, by praying constantly, by reading his word, by fellowshipping with him, by worshiping with him. God should definitely be the, most, the person we talk to the most. I know friends and family and loved ones, they talk to the same people on the phone every day, two, three hours a day, know their schedules like the back of their hands can tell you where they're at at all times. But even in those deep relationships, they should never be stronger than our relationship with God. If we got time to talk to someone on the phone 30 minutes a day, 45 minutes a day, an hour a day, then we should be spending twice as much time with God. I remember at one time I was into fantasy sports. I would wake up, watch ESPN, listen to the podcast two to three hours a day dedicated to fantasy sports. And then I would find myself struggling trying to find time to get my devotions done and to start and end my day with prayer and pray throughout the day. I quickly realized that I was worshiping fantasy sports, whether I want to admit it or not. And so I had to realign my priorities and say, even if this is something I'm going to continue to do, it must not overshadow or most, it must not overcome the time that I spend with God. And so we need to move to a place in our faith where even though we believe, even though we trust in God, that God is our main focus in our lives, that God is the person that we spend the most time with, that our day begins, ends, and moves around our relationship with God. So she recognizes that all she had to do was touch God. So Jesus not only senses the touch, but he recognizes the motive behind the touch. Now, in these crowds, there were many people all bumping into Jesus, all touching and reaching out for him. But he recognized there was a difference between this woman's touch and the other touches that he was receiving. It's the same for us. It's like a two-way street. Man, I've been blessed. I've been, uh, people have put envelopes in my hand. People have prayed for me. People have uh, laid hands on me. And I've received the blessings. I've been thankful for the blessings. I've accepted the prayers. Uh, but I recognize that a touch from God is something different and something that just can't be explained. And we should be able to recognize God's hand in our lives. Uh, oftentimes in life, uh, I, I used to always joke uh, with the young people. I would always, and I hope I don't ruin any young person that might be listening's uh, view of Santa Claus, but I really don't like Santa Claus. Uh, as I grew older, I started to recognize that when I would ask for Christmas gifts, me and my sister, uh, my parents would sacrifice for October and November, all of December, saving up money, not eating lunch, not going out, not going on dates, just so they could put gifts under the tree. And they would sign it from Santa Claus to Tommy, from Santa Claus to Kaila. And we'd be so happy. Oh, thank you, Santa. Santa finally brought us. Santa snuck down. We would lay out cookies and milk for Santa. 
And I, I, I thought about it. I never laid out cookies and milk for my mom and father. And they, they worked their butts off to provide for me and my sister to give us pretty much all that we needed. Oh, not pretty much all that we needed and pretty much all that we asked for. And yet, we give all the credit to some fat, uh, fair-skinned guy from the North Pole. And I think that we should just recognize the sacrifices that our parents make and stop giving credit to someone else. Well, it's the same thing with my faith. Uh, I, I honestly believe that sometimes God, sometimes God allows us to hit rock bottom, to allows us to have no friends, allows us to have nowhere to turn, so we can recognize it's not our friends, it's not our relationships, it's not our bank accounts, but it was God and God alone that healed our condition, that fixed our situation, that turned our lives around. And so we should be able to identify the hand of God in our lives. And oftentimes, when we're going through difficult situations, it's so God can get our attention and God can show us that it is he and him alone that is the one that is blessing us. Uh, the Old Testament connotation and this is the last thing in this part of our lesson, is that your physical condition uh, were evidence of personal or generational sin. But by, fill, by forgiving the sins along with the physical issues, Jesus puts down or puts away this idea of inherited sin and shows that our faith can not only heal, but it also can forgive us of our sins. As he did with the paralytic boy in the beginning of chapter 9, and now as he does again with this uh, woman with the issue of blood, he says, your faith has made you whole. And the whole is not just the healing of the issue of blood, but it literally means to save and to forgive in the Greek original language. And so Jesus allows forgiveness to take place because of the faith of this woman. And so we see that Jesus is not only able to heal us in the midst of our condition, but he's able to forgive us of our sins if we have the right faith and go to him with the right spirit. And so this text really is meant to show us are meant to teach us that there are no limits on the power of Jesus Christ if we approach him with the right faith. So we saw the request of a, request of a desperate father, Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 and 19. In verses 20 through 22, we see a sick but a determined woman. But finally, in verses 23 through 26, we see uh, Jesus demonstrates his authority over death. Again, Matthew chapter 9, verse 23 through 26, New King James Version the text reads, when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room, for the drill is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose, and the report of his, excuse me, and the report of this went out into all the land. So here we end our lesson seeing that Jesus demonstrates his authority over death. Jesus stops to heal and forgive the woman, but then he continues to the ruler's house. Now, in this text, we see a lack of urgency. Uh, the, 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 the ruler came to Jesus, heal my daughter. Now the daughter is dead, but Jesus is making stops. He's engaging with the crowd, and it shows no sense of urgency from our perspective. However, what Jesus illustrates is that the absence of urgency shows that God's timing and God's authority and power supersedes our understanding of time. When the doctor says nothing else can be done, we often think that that's it. However, God has the power and authority where his, it, it is not limited by man's timing and man's understanding. And so Jesus, even after the deadline passes, continues to make his way to this uh, ruler's daughter's, the ruler's house to raise his daughter from the dead. And even though the actual funeral has already began, Jesus still goes on into the house knowing that he can uh, raise her from the dead. So Jesus, he shows up in this funeral procession and turns it into a wake-up call. The people gathered outside are mourning the daughter's death, but the father did not allow the crowd to limit his faith in what he knew Jesus could do. Even when those around us are mourning, even when those around us have given us hope, that should never impact our faith because our faith has taught us and our experience has taught us that there is nothing beyond the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. So literally the crowds are crying and yelling out. They're worried about what can they do. They're depressed, they're distressed, they're, they're mourning the death of this young lady, but the father still has faith even in the midst of death. 
And I just wish that I could have a portion of this father's faith. That it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't even matter if the coroner's report has already been signed. That God has authority and power, yes, even over death in our lives. So when Jesus goes into the house and says that she's not dead, the crowds literally turn into laughs. By ridicule, they mean that they mocked and laughed at Jesus, thinking that he was foolish to assume that he could heal this woman. Oftentimes, I've learned that people will gather to watch you fail, to mourn with you, but they will seldom join in you in having faith that you can make it through your situation. But my brothers and sisters, again, we need to recognize that just because people are in our inner circle, even people in our home, like this ruler's home, doesn't mean that they have the same faith that we have. And so we should not limit our faith to the, to the uh, same type of faith that others around us have. But we need to recognize that even when others doubt, even the, when others don't believe, that our faith and our experience teaches us that God can still do the impossible. So the crowd should have been there to support, but instead they were there to mock and ridicule. And Jesus decides to put the unbelievers out and move forward into the room where the daughter lied. Sometimes you got to get rid of some people in your lives. And I'm not saying block them from your phone. I'm not saying uh, delete their number. But everybody with you is not for you. And some of the places that God is trying to take us, uh, perhaps we need to move forward without some of the baggage that we have. And baggage isn't just bad habits. Baggage just isn't a lack of faith. Baggage just isn't uh, sinful ways but sometimes baggage is the wrong people in the wrong crowds in our life. And we see numerous times when Jesus has to move people out the room in order for healing to take place. And my brothers and sisters, uh, I, I know we enjoy the company of some of our friends. We might even enjoy uh, the fun that we have and the good times. But every now and then we need to recognize that if you're not going or headed to the same place that I'm going, then maybe we can't ride together. Uh, we are in the midst of National Congress. It starts tomorrow, and I'm teaching uh, Christian dating. Uh, and one of the big things that I always ask is, do you think it's all right for Christians to date non-Christians? And most of the people say, yeah, because you can let your faith influence them in this evangelism. I say, I didn't ask about sharing the gospel. I said dating. And we talk about in relationships and dating relationships that you depend on that person to help you make decisions in your life. And you trust that person's uh, uh, counsel. You trust that person's advice. And so if, in fact, we're going to lean on someone to help us through difficult times in our lives, we should, of course, be looking at someone that has the faith that we have in God, that believes in God the same way that we do, that is heaven-bound as we are. And so I always make the statement, if you're a Christian, you should probably not only not date other uh, non-Christians, but you probably shouldn't even be friends with non-Christians. I know that sounds harsh, but again, I say it all the time. If you're not headed to the same place I'm headed, if we're not going in the same direction, it really makes no sense for us to ride together. And in life, so many of us are riding with people, are in relationship with people, are living with people, are hanging out with people that have different destinations through, for their eternity than we do. And if we are going to move forward with the full blessings of God, if we're going to have the support of our friends and loved ones to help us through difficult times in our faith by being a proper example of faith in their own lives, then maybe we should recognize that some people in our lives we need to get rid of. And so how do we do that? We just pray for the sermon, that God reveal to us who belongs and who does not belong, that God clarify relationships, and that God makes it easier for us to have the right crowd in our lives. So again, Jesus doesn't do a lot of talking. He simply takes the girl's hand and she immediately gets up. It, it's not the right words. It's not a big act. It's not even a crowd to witness. Jesus just engages with those that believe and he moves in their lives in a certain, sudden and miraculous way. The Bible says the word continues to spread. And then we see that it was the testimony of others that got the attention of this woman with the issue of blood. It was the testimony of others that got the attention of this ruler. And their testimony of others pushed them into belief. And their belief pushed them into engaging with God. In a time of great discomfort and disorder for the children of God, these children of Israel during this time of Roman occupation some 2,000 years ago, it was not only the sermons, it was not only the crowds, but it was the testimonies 
of those that had seen and experienced the work of God, that had seen and experienced Jesus for themselves, that spread the news of his power and changed the entire world. The Christian faith spread like wildfire during the first and second centuries uh, of the common era. And there was such a necessity for this spreading because there was a misunderstanding of salvation and God had begun to expand salvation to the Gentiles beyond the Jewish people. And so in these dark times, God used the witness and the testimony of others to spread his good news, the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. And I believe that in a time in which we live in today, where it is just so difficult just to even walk out your home, we can't turn on the news without hearing about mass shootings or robberies or home invasions. Even in the most affluent areas or neighborhoods in this city, we're continuing to see senseless violence and murder and mayhem. But if we allow our witness to influence our testimony, the good works that we've seen God perform in our lives, and we spread that testimony like wildfire, it can change the world. The ruler heard. It wasn't no Bible. It wasn't the word of God. Jesus had not yet even died and risen from the dead. Just the wonderful works of Jesus Christ impacted the lives of his followers so much that they spread the word and it pushed others into belief. Now we know how this story ends. We know that God sent his son Jesus and Jesus sacrificed his life by dying on the cross for our sins. And we see day by day, not only through the history of the Bible, not only through the history of our people and our ancestors, but in our own lives, the power of God and the wonderful things he has done in and for each and every one of us. So if we allow that same testimony that the ruler heard, that same testimony that the woman with the issue of blood heard, if we have that same testimony, not only can we spread the gospel the same way, but we can change the world in which we live in. So I encourage you today to not only have the faith of these two individuals, the ruler and the woman with the issue of blood, to not care what others think, to not let nothing prevent us from getting to Christ, but to engage in God based on what we hear and what we believe, but also to spread the news to share with others what God has done for us. Imagine the changes that this world can have. I believe it, it, it can change. I believe it can get better if we just simply have faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not ready to give up. I'm not ready to throw in the towel. I know so many times I hear people praying. They're talking about, oh, we see the end is coming. We hear wars and rumors of wars. But the Bible makes it clear. No man knows the day nor the hour. And so I don't know if Jesus will come back before this lesson ends or if we'll get another thousand years. But I do know with the time that we have, we can share the good news of Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection, and we can change this world the same way that they did in our lesson. What a wonderful lesson. I praise God for each and every one of you. Thank you for joining us again. Happy Father's Day to each and every one of the fathers, to our pastor, Dr. Backus, uh, to my own father, uh, Thomas Savage Sr., to Christie's father, uh, Brother Cooper, we just praise God for each and every father, for all the men that are listening, for all the men that are, do not have children of their own, but continue to impact the lives of the children around them, and for especially the fathers here at Friendship, we praise God for each and every one of you. Uh, for those of you all that would like to support this church in giving, we do have four ways to give. You can look on your screen, you can give on our cash app, dollar sign Friendship Chicago. You can go to our website, fbcchicago.org. You can text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462, or you can mail your check or money order to the church care of Reginald Backus, uh, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. For those of you all who have given and continue to give, we praise God for your sacrifice, and please know that you are sowing a seed in fertile ground, and we honor the Lord uh, for all that you have done to support this ministry as we continue to do what God has called us to do. Uh, we would like to encourage you to join our other worship services throughout the week. Uh, you can join us on uh, Tuesday mornings at 8 a.m. Uh, we have our prayer call led by our senior associate, Reverend Aaron Davison. That call, that number is on your screen, 978-990-5064. The code is 
8954 every Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. a group of prayer warriors. Uh, just some great worship time where we can just sacrifice and ask God to not only reveal his will for our lives and for our church, but to just heal our land. You can join us each Sunday morning at 930 on our Facebook and YouTube page for our Sunday school lessons at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays for our evening Bible class as our pastor, Dr. Bacchus, is moving through the miracles of Jesus. And then, of course, each Sunday morning at 11 a.m. for our live worship service. We have a wonderful worship today. Today is our celebration Sunday where we honor the accomplishments of our members. And not only are we celebrating Father's Day, but we are also going to honor our graduates. And we'll post a video later for all of our graduates, but we'll be able to call out each graduate's name. So we encourage you to join us for our worship service in just a few moments at 11 a.m. Praise God for each and every one of you. Continue to pray for our church. Continue to trust in God in all things. And one last time, happy Father's Day to each and every man out there that has been a blessing in the lives of young people all throughout this nation. Let's bow our heads in prayer and be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the faith of Jairus and this, I mean, excuse me, the faith of this ruler and this woman with the issue of blood. They have exemplified for us that they heard about you, that their hearing pushed them into belief, and their belief uh, pushed them into engaging based on their faith. Help us to understand that all we have to do is take our burdens and place them in your hands, and that you can make a way out of no way. Even at the point of death, you still have the power and the authority to do what the world cannot do, to make a way out of no way. So, Father, continue to reveal your will for our lives. Continue to show us your wonderful power and help us to understand that our experience with you should encourage and influence our testimony and our witness. And if we properly engage with the world, that in the love of God and the faith that we have in you permeate our actions and all that we do, we can change the world. Father, we ask a special prayer for our fathers. Continue to bless and keep each and every one of them continue to reveal your will for their lives. Continue to help them hold up the bloodstained banner as they continue to influence generation of generation of young men and young boys uh, to be servants to you and uh, follow you in all that we do. Now, Father, bless this church. Bless our pastor. Bless each and every member. Bless each person that is gathered on this uh, social media, this YouTube and Facebook pages as we continue to study your word and worship your name uh, through these lessons. Thank you for your will, thank you for your word, and thank you for your saving power. It is in your darling son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen to each and every one of you. May God bless and continue to keep you. And for the fifth or sixth time, happy Father's Day to all the men. God bless.